Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about evidence. Uh, why do we know that CO2, the CO2 increase has been caused by humans? Uh, this, these are, this is the full record of direct measurements of CO2 made at Mauna Loa, a volcanic uh, mountain in the uh, main island of Hawaii. They were started by uh, Dave Keeling of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. So Dave Keeling started these measurements in 1958. At, at this point, it wasn't known actually whether CO2 in the atmosphere was increasing or decreasing or staying the same. There were, was conflicting evidence. Uh, a number of years measurements had been made in Sweden, uh, but it wasn't even clear there was a seasonal cycle. It just appeared there was a lot of variability. So Keeling was the first one who actually did it right, and I'll, I'll show you what that means. <coughs> this is a piece of our uh, recorder at uh, our CO2 instrument that's recording CO2 at Mauna Loa. So what you see is these regular jogs. These are hourly injections of three different reference gases. So the instrument measures CO2 by the absorption that CO2 causes uh, in infrared radiation. So uh, infrared light is shining through a detector cell. Outside air is pumped into the cell and we record the absorption that is taking place. More CO2, more absorption. And so that is the, the, the noisy signal in the middle, which turns red or green. Uh, these, these, and this instrument is being kept on track by these hourly injections of reference gases. I'll, more about reference gases later. Uh, we are looking at Mono, we're looking for what's called background air. So we do, do not want to be measuring what's happening on the island. So during the day, for example, very often uh, air is uh, flowing up the slope because the mountain slope is being heated and the air becomes less dense and it moves up. And so air is being pulled actually from lower elevations on the island where there's plants, a lot of vegetation, pretty vigorous actually on the east side of the island, drawing down CO2 during the day. We're not so interested in that because we know that plants draw down CO2. What we want to measure is what we call background air that is characteristic of a large portion of the free troposphere, it's called the, so the mid troposphere, you know, heights of between three and five kilometers over the Pacific Ocean and in fact over the Northern Hemisphere. And we see that when first the wind direction is right, when we have downslope wind, so especially at night, the mountain cools, the surface cools, the air cools down and becomes denser, flows down the slope, pulling air from above, actually. There's no vegetation, actually, around the observing site for many miles. And that is the very flat portion there on the left. You see very flat trace. There is air that is coming from the middle of the atmosphere over the Pacific Ocean. That air is representative of a large area of the Northern Hemisphere. So uh, we look at this data and we exclude then the variable parts. We could have, for example, volcanic emissions of CO2 from the crater of Mauna Loa. It's very easy to pick that out in the record because that is, is distinguished by this flat background of mid-Pacific air interrupted by very sharp spikes of a volcanic plume, if you will. It's very easy to exclude. There's really no question about that. In addition, we measure SO2 in these volcanic plumes. Okay. <coughs> then in addition, <coughs> we don't just trust the reference gases because reference gases are, we produce them actually here in Boulder in high pressure cylinders and we calibrate them very carefully, send them out. It is possible that a cylinder could drift the concentration of CO2 could slowly change. For example, if there's a tiny leak in the, in the link between the reference gas and the, and the analyzer. So in addition, we have, that's, you see that in the red, uh, there's an extra gas there near the top. There's another reference gas, if you will. We call that a target gas. It's made here also in Boulder and independently calibrated and we send it out and it pro provides a check 
a consistency check on the reference gases. If it appears that the reference gas, <coughs> so we, we calibrate there the reference gas with the station standards, the reference standards. If the, the measured concentration of the reference gas appears to be changing, we have a problem. So send back and we make sure the, the, uh, the, the target gas is changing, or if not, one of the references is changing. Then we can take care of that. Uh, <coughs> and even that is not enough because, uh, sure, this, uh, this analyzer is very carefully calibrated. Uh, that is not enough all by itself because we bring air, outside air, into the analyzer through an intake line all the way to the top of, uh, I'll show you this, from the top of the mast. There could be a leak in that intake line. There could be water collected somewhere in the intake line. CO2 is a very soluble gas, which could create delays, if you will. Uh, you know, CO2, if it goes up, it, some of it dissolves in the water, and then pro potential problems. Uh, the analyzer itself could have problems, temperature control, flow control, etc. So in addition to the analyzer with the reference gases, we also collect flask samples, completely independent of the analyzer. And these are, two, these are done weekly. Uh, you see those, there's two records of different ways of collecting these flash samples. We compare that with the hourly average of the analyzer, also at Mount Loa. This, this is an independent check done via a different method. And then in addition, Dave, Keeling's, uh, Dave Keeling actually passed away in uh, 2005, but Scripps is still making its own measurements at Mount Loa. We compare all the time with Scripps measurements, and Scripps has also flash measurements. That's what Keeling started doing right from the start. Both flash measurements and well-calibrated uh, continuous measurements to independent methods. So actually at Mount Lowell, we happen to have four different ways of measuring CO2. And this is kind of typical. The level of agreement <coughs> is uh, 0.2 ppm or better, typically. Not for an individual flask, but if you know, on a, if you put a smoother through the record, that we do not want to have systematic offset uh, over a period of several months to years, and that's what this the smooth curves actually represent. So, we measure that CO2 is going up currently every year by zero by 2.0 ppm on average per year, and we can make these measurements. With very, we are very certain actually that they are, they are good to 0.2. In fact, uh, the calibration that Keeling had in 1958, we're quite certain it is not different from what we have now. It's consistent with what we have now to a few tenths of one ppm. So when we say that CO2 has increased by more than 100 ppm since the beginning of the industrial period, or actually by since Keeling started, it was in 58, it was maybe 314, 315 ppm. And now it's almost 400. So it has increased by uh, 75 since Keeling started. We know that to a few tenths of one ppm. So the relative error on that increase is much less than 1%. But despite that, <coughs> There are people, climate skeptics, who will say, uh, oh yeah, Mauna Loa, these guys, us, they take that data and they do data selection. They pick whatever they like, so that if you, they, they, they use only 15% of the data and 85% gets thrown away. If you do that, you can get anything. They just create the impression of an increase. In fact, this is uh, what Ian Plimmer says. <clears throat> Ian Plimmer is an Australian geologist, and he wrote a book recently. He's called Courageous by fellow skeptics. He's a con man. <clears throat> because he makes this statement about Mauna Loa, that it's just, this is, it's in his book. He, uh, like, some 82% of the raw data is edited leaving just 18% of the raw data measurements for statistical analysis. 
with such savage editing, whatever trend one wants can be shown. Well, he could have checked this statement that he made in the book because our data are available on the web for everybody. So you can download Mauna Loa hourly averages if you want, and you can plot them all. Uh, and, and so let's say that's in the purple color. The color doesn't come through so well, actually. Uh, so you can see in all data, you can see significant low values in the middle of the summer. And that is basically the, the vegetation on the island drawing down CO2, which we select out. This is all very, you know, when you, when you look at the data, it's actually all, there's quality control characters. We don't throw anything away. So you get it all and you can plot it. Now, can you get any trend you want, even if you throw nothing out? No, you get exactly the same trend. If you, if you do the monthly means based on all data, you get these bluish uh, horizontal bars, monthly means of all data. Selected is in the red bars. The only difference really that our data selection has is the seasonal cycle is a little bit different because we do not see in our data selection, we do not see the drawdown by plants on the island. So the seasonal cycle is different, but the trend is identical. Now he could just have verified this for himself. That's why I say he's a con man. And there's lots of other statements in his book that are made in the same way, actually. This is just an example. Now, <clears throat> is it humans? So we've, we've really verified that CO2 is increasing. There is no doubt about it. Uh, now, of course, we were talking earlier about science. Does, do scientists ever know something? Well, you know, philosophically, you can never prove anything positive in science. You can only disprove things philosophically. But you know, after you've disproven, you could say the wrong theory or the wrong explanation, if you've disproven it 10,000 times in different ways, I'd say it's about time you start taking it seriously. So when I talk to a general audience about the CO2 increase, I just say flatly, it's 100%, we have caused 100% of it. Human action has. The natural component is negligible. And that is what's shown, this part of the evidence is shown here. So the last, uh, what I showed you, the Keeling plot, that's the, the right-hand panel, the seasonal cycle is being removed. So this is directly measured, it's very certain. And then there's a piece in the middle from a thousand uh, years ago to today, to, to 19, the mid 20th century, that's done in ice cores in Antarctica by different labs, not just one lab, with very careful procedures, different from what we do, but it's, the principles are the same. They do this in different ways and they compare with other people doing it. You publish it, uh, people criticize it, it really goes through the ringer. And what you see is, compared to the last thousand years, it's quite exceptional what is happening right now. And then you can go back further, 800,000 years. This is now ice cores, partially in Greenland, but mostly in Antarctica to go back that far. And actually, they're still working on that. They probably can go past one million years, likely. And you see that CO2 has changed between you know, 180 and 270, 280 ppm between ice ages and glacial periods. And uh, you see that what's happening today is quite exceptional. In fact, it goes back further than this. There's very good evidence from uh, sediment cores in the Atlantic Ocean that extend this record back to 2.1 million years. And again, so the portion from 2.1 million years and then until about a couple hundred thousand years ago, overlapping with the ice core record. See, again, different method. You analyze aspects of a sediment core in the Atlantic where you can actually reconstruct ocean acidity from. And ocean acidity is directly correlated with CO2 because CO2 is an acid. You compare that with the direct measurements in ice cores in Greenland. And the portion of those two records that overlap actually gives you the same answer. Anyway, so this pattern that you see there extends back further 2.1 million years. I would say this is a 
all by itself is actually very strong evidence that we have something to do with this. It's not only CO2, there's a host of other gases that gives you the same picture. That, you know, especially in the 20th century, things take off for not only for CO2, but for dozens of gases. And actually, we know that we are emitting these gases too. We should not forget that. Uh, now, I have a mass balance argument. Uh, there, there are two curves on here. The red is the cumulative fossil fuel emissions, so the, the total amount of fossil fuel CO2 that we've put into the atmosphere, according to economic statistics, in initially coal and then coal and oil, and now coal, oil, and gas. The cumulative amount, and then the increase in black, the increase in the atmosphere that's observed from both the Mauna Loa data and the global data, and then uh, before that from the ice cores. And they don't entirely match. But there's more. <clears throat> there's also the line in blue that is CO the CO measured CO2 increase in the ocean. I should say modeled and measured. What is measured is actually that little uh, that point. This the blue curve is the, the cumulative oceanic increase. Uh, so the, 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 the curve is actually modeled. But there's one measured point on there. That is the sort of the distillation of several decades of deep ocean measurements where uh, oceanic research ships, they cross the crisscross the world's oceans. And at regular points, they stop and they do a depth cast. They take samples all the way from the surface to the bottom. These bottles trip at certain depth. And then they bring them back up and analyze the water chemically. And so doing that, you can actually trace the increase of CO2 in the modern oceans that took place over the last 100 years or so. And that's that uh, point with the error bar, the uncertainty on that. Uh, so in other words, the model does portray what has been observed. So we have, should have some faith in this ocean model portray portrayal. Now it turns out that if you add up uh, the observed oceanic increase and the observed atmospheric increase, it within the error is equal to the total amount we've emitted. So this is a mass balance argument. We know that we've emitted this stuff and we've actually found it. Then you see the green, that is the net terrestrial uptake, is very difficult to observe because the terrestrial biosphere how much carbon is in there? You know, it varies by orders of magnitude, depending on where you are. And it even varies on very small scales, so it's pretty hard to measure, actually. But what we've done here is we, uh, we solved that equation there on the bottom. We, we, we have a mass balance. Fossil fuel emissions plus net terrestrial sources equals the atmospheric increase and the oceanic increase. That's just a mass balance. The carbon can't go anywhere else. These are the... Okay, more evidence. Now, if, you, if you're not convinced, there's still more evidence. <laughs> um, and that, not every, not every carbon is born the same. There's, you know, there's three different kinds of carbon. There's carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14. They all have this, these, these carbon nuclei all they have the same number of protons, positive charge of six plus which makes them have six electrons, which makes them chemically react as carbon. But some of them has, have an extra neutron, which doesn't have much of a chemical effect, just minor chemical effect. No, it's still carbon. So there's carbon-13, an extra neutron, and carbon-14 has two extra neutrons, so it's a little heavier. Okay, now suppose that, uh, you know, you were genetically incapable of accepting the fact that humans are causing the CO2 increase well, we are capable of looking at evidence. Here's more evidence. Uh, so it turns out that the atmosphere has an isotopic ratio of C13 to C12 of 1.1%. That's in the third column there. The, ocean, the CO2 that comes out of the ocean has that same isotopic ratio. Uh, but what comes from the terrestrial biosphere has a little bit less C13. It's instead of 1.1%, 1 
just like slightly more than 1.1, it's slightly less than 1.1%. Same for natural gas and coal uh, <clears throat> and, and oil. So this gives us a way to distinguish from atmospheric measurements alone, actually, between different sources of carbon. So you might say, you might have the hypothesis, oh, the CO2 increase that we see in the atmosphere is a burp from the ocean. Well, let's see if that's the case. Nope, it can't be. This is a history of the C13-12 ratio in the atmosphere for the last 100, well, 200 years, partially from tree rings and there's different, different evidence for that too. And the, the most recent stuff is on the, to the, to the lower, on the lower right. You see that the atmospheric C13-12 ratio has decreased if the increase that is currently taking place in the atmosphere is from an, some natural CO2 burp from the oceans the C13-12 ratio would not have changed. So this really says very clearly the increase that we see is from something organic, either from the modern terrestrial biosphere or the old terrestrial biosphere, <laughs> coal, oil, or natural gas. There is no choice, really. So we have only two candidates left for the increase. Go back. <laughs> now we have the third isotope, that is carbon-14. Carbon-14 is uh, radioactive, and it's produced by cosmic rays in the upper atmosphere. And it's basically spread throughout the C14. In, 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 in atmospheric CO2 is slightly radioactive. It is in plants because they assimilate that. It's in us because we eat it. So our C14-12 ratio is the same as it, what it is in the atmosphere, pretty much. But then when we die, uh, and everything starts decaying and going away, the C14 slowly disappears because it's radioactive. And that's the basis of radioactive dating. So the atmosphere and the oceans, terrestrial biosphere have, uh, we call it, you know, the, the C14 to carbon ratio, total carbon ratio is the same as in the standard. The standard is, you could say, you know, 19th century wood, arbitrary standard. And we compare everything to that. So we need, we need to have something to compare, you know, to, to put numbers on things. And so it's close to one. It's a little bit above one, but due to nuclear testing, actually, in the 1960s. Now let's look at the evidence. Here's the evidence. This black curve is what's observed in the atmosphere. And you can see the effect of nuclear testing in the early 60s. C14 doubled in the atmosphere. It was one of the reasons, actually, that the nuclear test ban treaty was signed, because people were calculating what it would mean for enhanced cancer rates in humans and in the rest of the biosphere, by the way. But, and it was considered serious enough that you know, we should really stop atmospheric testing. So it was a contributor to the test ban treaty. And then you see the surface oceans is in blue, also observed. And what you see is that despite the fact that C14 doubled in the atmosphere, the atmosphere has now become lower than the surface ocean. This is really quite unnatural, because in the natural world, without human intervention, C14 is produced in the atmosphere. The atmosphere is always slightly higher than the oceans, and is currently reversed, despite the testing. This can only be the case if we have a source of CO2 in the atmosphere that is old, that has no or very little C14 in it. And we know what that is. Fossil fuels are old. The, the carbon-14 has long decayed to zero. So this is isotopic evidence, very strong evidence, that the source of the CO2 increase is organic material and it's old. And furthermore, this is a different piece of evidence. This is, it's in the Northern Hemisphere, mostly, and it's increasing. Now, we've pretty much nailed it now, even if we didn't know that we were burning fossil fuels. So CO2, the difference between what we measure at Mauna Loa and the South Pole, and Mauna Loa, on an annual mean basis, is always a little higher than the South Pole, and the difference has increased roughly in the same proportion 
as the increased rate of fossil fuel burning. It so happens. And of course, most of the fossil fuel burning takes place in the Northern Hemisphere. So this is then, you could call it geographic evidence of the source of CO2. So now I've given you all the various kinds of evidence why we know that the CO2 increase that we see is caused by humans, by us. In fact, by us burning fuels. Here's another thing. If you say that uh, this is uh, CO2, oh yeah, some kind of a natural cycle, then the question is, you, have then, you are then required to explain what happens to the CO2 that we know we are emitting by burning fuels. What happens to that? Where did it go? It's never answered by people who claim that we're looking at some kind of a burp of the natural system. Anyway, just, I, I guess I'll stop here. I, I got a lot more slides, but um, I just stop with the evidence. <laughs>